Thrombosis is simply the formation of blood clots within the vascular system. The proper definition of thrombosis is formation of a structured, solid mass within the vascular system from the constituents of blood due to inappropriate activation of hemostatic mechanisms. And thrombosis should take place in flowing blood when the person is alive. Blood clotting process after the death of a person is called post-mortem clotting. It is different from the process of thrombosis. And it is important to note that a hematoma is also different from thrombosis. A hematoma is formed when blood extravasates into a tissue, such as in cerebral hemorrhages. But thrombosis takes place within the vascular system. First let's recall how our blood prevents thrombosis in a normal person. Under normal circumstances, endothelial cells actively prevent thrombosis by producing various factors that block platelet adhesion and aggregation, inhibit coagulation, and lice clots. These are called antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and fibrinolytic effects respectively. First let's see antiplatelet effects. Endothelial cells constantly secrete nitric oxide and prostacyclin, which inhibits platelet adhesion and aggregation, and thereby prevents thrombosis. Also, intact endothelium prevents platelets from coming into contact with subendothelium. Furthermore, endothelial cells produce adenosine diphosphatase, an enzyme which degrades ADP to further prevent platelet aggregation. After a platelet plug is formed, the next step of hemostasis is activation of the coagulation cascade, which ultimately results in deposition of fibrin over the platelet plug. Anticoagulant effects are aimed at inhibiting the coagulation cascade. Endothelial cells secrete heparin-like molecules, which act as cofactors for a molecule called antithrombin-3. Antithrombin-3 in turn inhibits factor 2, 9, and 10, and inhibits coagulation. Endothelial cells also secrete a molecule called thrombomodulin, which binds to thrombin, also known as factor 2. Thrombin in turn activates an enzyme called protein C. Activated protein C then inhibits factor 5 and 8 to inhibit coagulation. Fibrinolytic effects are aimed at lysing the clots after fibrin deposition. Endothelial cells produce tissue-type plasminogen activator, which induces the conversion of inactive plasminogen into its active form, plasmin. Then plasmin cleaves fibrin to degrade thrombi. Now we know how our blood prevents thrombosis in normal physiological conditions. Next we move on to the pathology part. Three primary abnormalities of the circulation lead to the development of thrombosis called Virchow's triad. They include endothelial injury, alterations in the normal blood flow. This could be either turbulence or stasis of blood, and hypercoagulability of blood. This diagram is from the Robbins textbook of pathology. These factors can promote thrombosis independently or in combination, and they are also interconnected. Endothelial integrity is the most important factor to maintain the normal blood flow. Endothelial injury can predispose to thrombosis, and at the same time it can alter the normal blood flow and induce the hypercoagulability of blood. Abnormal blood flow may also cause endothelial injury and can induce the hypercoagulability of blood. Let's discuss about these factors in more detail in the following sections. Endothelial injury is the predominant factor for thrombosis in the heart and the arterial circulation. Major causes for endothelial injury include ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques hypertension and turbulent blood flow, inflammatory conditions involving blood vessels, such as vasculitis, hypoxia, bacterial toxins, cigarette smoke, radiation, intravenous injections, and homocystinemia. When there is endothelial damage, the underlying subendothelium may be exposed. Then platelets get adhered to the subendothelium, followed by aggregation of more and more platelets, to form a platelet plug. Then the coagulation cascade gets activated with resultant fibrin deposition over the platelet plug. When blood flows over this primary thrombus, other cells such as red blood cells and white blood cells also get entrapped within the fibrin meshwork. This newly formed thrombus tends to protrude towards the lumen of the vessel. So, it causes turbulence with more platelet adhesion, resulting in a thrombus of alternating layers of platelets, fibrin, and red blood cells. Not only that, dysfunctional endothelial cells produce more procoagulant factors and less anticoagulant factors, which also increases the tendency of thrombosis. Alterations in the normal blood flow could be either turbulence or stasis. Normal blood has a laminar flow, meaning that the plasma flows in the periphery and formed elements including blood cells and platelets flow centrally. 
Thus, laminar flow prevents platelets from coming in contact with the endothelium. When the blood flow becomes turbulent, this laminar flow becomes disrupted, and there is no separation between plasma and blood cells. Turbulent flow commonly contributes to arterial and cardiac thrombi. Turbulence produces counter currents, also known as eddy currents in the affected area, and causes endothelial injury. In addition, turbulence brings platelet in contact with the endothelium, induces endothelial activation, and enhances procoagulant activity of the endothelium and ultimately leads to thrombosis. Situations where turbulence predisposes to thrombosis include the following. Atherosclerosis of the arteries causes narrowing of the arterial lumen, which leads to turbulence and ultimately to thrombosis. When these plaques get ulcerated, both endothelial injury and turbulence contribute to thrombosis. In aneurysmal sacs at the opening, the blood flow is turbulent and can predispose to thrombosis. Another instance is heart valve incompetence, which disrupts the laminar flow and predisposes to thrombosis. In stasis, the blood flow is stagnant. Stasis is the major contributor in the development of venous thrombi. Stasis induces thrombosis by promoting endothelial activation, enhancing procoagulant activity, preventing the washout and dilution of activated clotting factors, and preventing the inflow of clotting factor inhibitors. Situations where stasis induces thrombosis include the following. Following a myocardial infarction, the affected areas of the myocardium become non-contractile and there will be stasis of blood, leading to thrombosis. In rheumatic mitral valve stenosis, there will be dilation of the left atrium, along with atrial fibrillation, which leads to stasis, followed by thrombosis. Another place where stasis contributes to thrombosis is within a new rhizomal sacs. Now, do not confuse this with the early example. Blood within an aneurysmal sac is in a state of stasis. And at the opening of the aneurysm, blood flow is turbulent. In conditions where the viscosity of blood increases, such as polycythemia, there is resistance to the blood flow. And, small vessel stasis occurs. In sickle cell disease, abnormal red cells tend to clump together and obstruct small vessels. And there will be stasis of blood. Another example is prolonged bed rest, particularly after a surgery. There will be stasis of blood within the leg veins due to the reduced activity of the muscular milking action of leg muscles. And this may lead to venous thrombosis. Hypercoagulability is a less frequent contributor for thrombosis. However, it is as important as the other two primary abnormalities. Hypercoagulability is defined as any alteration of the coagulation pathways that predisposes to thrombosis. Causes of hypercoagulability could be either genetic or acquired. Commonest genetic causes include factor V leadin mutation, prothrombin mutation, sticky platelet syndrome, and elevated factor VIII, 9, 11, or fibrinogen. Commonest acquired causes include prolonged bed rest or immobilization, tissue injury like surgery, fracture, or burn, myocardial infarction, cancer, disseminated intravascular coagulation, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now let's discuss about the characteristic features of arterial and venous thrombi. As we already know, arterial thrombosis usually occurs at the sites of endothelial injury and turbulence. Arterial thrombi in large vessels, such as aorta, and the heart are non-occlusive. But small vessel thrombi are often occlusive. Commonly involved arteries include cerebral arteries, coronary arteries, and femoral artery. Atherosclerosis is the major cause of arterial thrombosis because it causes both turbulence and endothelial injury. Arterial thrombi show characteristic alternating bands of pale and dark areas, called lines of zon. Pale areas represent platelets and fibrin component, and dark areas represent red blood cells. More common clinical manifestation of arterial thrombosis is ischemia and infarction of the tissue distal to the thrombus if it is occlusive such as in myocardial infarction and stroke. In addition, they can embolize due to the rapid flow. Venous thrombosis can be broadly categorized into two types, thrombophlebitis and phlebothrombosis. As the name suggests, in thrombophlebitis, inflammation of the veins leads to thrombosis, and the thrombus is well attached to the vessel wall. Inflammation could be either sterile or non-sterile. Causes of sterile inflammation include trauma, radiation, intravenous solutions, and certain chemicals. In non-sterile inflammation, presence of infection causes formation of septic thrombi. 
and these thrombi may give rise to septic emboli. In phlebothrombosis, there is no inflammation. Stasis plays a major role in the formation of thrombi. Risk factors include immobilization or prolonged bed rest, trauma, hypercoagulability, surgery, a situation where the synthesis of clotting factors by the liver increases, and heart failure. Phlebothrombosis predominantly occurs in superficial and deep leg veins. Superficial phlebothrombosis typically occurs in the saphenous vein. Common clinical manifestations include local edema and swelling, impaired venous drainage, both of which predisposes to overlying skin infections and varicose ulcers. Pain and tenderness is another complaint. Embolization in superficial venous thrombosis is rare. Deep venous thrombosis commonly occurs in popliteal, femoral, and iliac veins. Most often they embolize to the lungs, giving rise to pulmonary infarctions. They also cause pain and local edema. In contrast to arterial thrombi, venous thrombi are more red in color because they have more red blood cells and less platelets. Therefore, lines of zon are not very prominent in venous thrombosis. In addition to arterial and venous thrombosis, there are another two types of thrombi. One is mural thrombi, which occur in heart chambers or in the aortic lumen. Arrhythmias, dilated cardiomyopathy, and myocardial infarction are the commonest causes for cardiac mural thrombi while ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques and aneurysms are the commonest causes for aortic mural thrombi. Vegetations are the thrombi occurring on heart valves. Blood-borne bacteria or fungi can adhere to previously damaged heart valves, such as in rheumatic heart disease. Or, they can directly damage the healthy valves, causing endothelial injury, as well as turbulence, and lead to thrombosis. In addition, sterile vegetations may also occur in non-infected heart valves in people with hypercoagulable states. This condition is known as non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. Next we discuss about the fate of a thrombus. One is propagation, where the thrombus accumulate additional platelets and fibrin to increase in size, as indicated by this crude diagram. It is important to keep in mind that propagation of a thrombus is always towards the heart. So, venous thrombi propagate towards the blood flow, whereas arterial thrombi propagate retrograde to the blood flow. Another one is embolization, where thrombi dislodge and travel to other sites in the vasculature. Embolism is another major topic in general pathology. I will discuss about it in more detail in another video. Most probably the next one. If the thrombus is relatively smaller, it may undergo dissolution as a result of fibrinolysis. However, older thrombi become resistant to fibrinolysis because of the extensive fibrin deposition. Therefore, therapeutic administration of fibrinolytic agents such as tissue plasminogen activator is generally effective within the first few hours of a thrombotic episode. Older thrombi which are resistant to fibrinolysis may undergo organization or recanalization with time. Older thrombi become organized by the ingrowth of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and fibroblasts and ultimately establish the continuity of the lumen to variable degrees. Organization typically occurs in venous thrombi, where the blood flow is generally slow. Recanalization typically occurs in arterial thrombi, where the blood flow and demand is high. In this process, thrombus undergoes enzymatic digestion to make way for the flowing blood, as you can see in this picture. And ultimately, the remaining part of the thrombus becomes fibrosed and gets attached to the vessel wall. Now let's discuss about some important clinical manifestations of thrombosis. Some of them we have already discussed in previous slides. We may recall them as well. Clinical manifestations of arterial and cardiac thrombosis include the following. Ischemia and infarction due to obstruction. For example, myocardial infarction due to coronary artery obstruction. Cerebral infarction due to carotid artery obstruction. And acute lower limb ischemia and infarction due to femoral or popliteal artery obstruction. Second most common and important manifestation is thromboemboli and microemboli generation. Cardiac and aortic neural thrombi can embolize and travel to organs where the blood supply is high, including kidneys, brain, and spleen. Infective endocarditis is another manifestation. If the thrombus is relatively large, arterial narrowing may occur after recanalization. And also, recanalization causes weakening of the vessel wall, which may result in aneurysm formation. Sometimes, these aneurysms get infected by bacteria. Then they are called mycotic aneurysms. And, arterial thrombi also predispose to atheroma formation.
Manifestations of venous thrombosis include the following. Edema and swelling. Pulmonary embolism. Varicose vein formation. Septic emboli and abscess formation. Pymia. And, if total venous outflow obstruction occurs, venous infarction. However, venous infarction is very rare because of the presence of collateral connections. Finally, let's discuss about the differences between an anti-mortem thrombus and a post-mortem clot. We have already discussed the features of an anti-mortem thrombus. They are well attached to the vessel wall. And lines of zon are usually present. They are firm. They are also dry and crumble. So, can be broken down into small fragments. In contrast, post-mortem clots are not attached to vessel walls. And no lines of zon. Because there is no platelet component. Post-mortem clot is a jelly-like mass, which contains red cells in the lower portion, settled by gravity. And the upper portion consists of plasma, which is also called as chicken fat. Here is an image of a post-mortem clot. They are moist and soft. And can be pulled out in one mass.